Good morning, everyone. Uh, we just have to put the mics right there. Okay. So we check. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael. Um, I'm a farmer at the farm school, and today I'm going to be the host for the uh, for this presentation, which is on how um, we can support insects with native plants. Um, and we are attending our Wemby Bead uh, today. Um, we have Yuri. Yuli Larimer, who is the director of horticulture for Native Plant Trust. Um, they, um, he oversees the facilities and operations at the garden in the woods and at Nasami Farm. Uli brings 20 years of experience working with native plants in public gardens uh, with previous positions in the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Wave Hill Garden and the U.S. National Arboretum. He's a tireless, tireless advocate for the use of native plants in the science spaces through his public speaking, writing, lectures, and media appearances. His most recent publication, um, In the Northeast Native Plant Primer, 235 Plants for an Earth-Friendly Garden. Yuli feels most grounded with his hands in the soil. That's great. I, I share that too. <laughs> um, bear with me. Oh. Um, and this conference is presented on land that has been stewarded by the indigenous people before European colonization. And as we work to heal the destruction caused by colonization, we appreciate your support, solidarity, and continue learning. And um, here we are on a different group, but I'm sure we're on Nekmuk land. Um, and here on this slide, you can see a link to a site which can give you um, information about the land that you are occupying. Um, so um, racial equity in the food system. Um, there is a caucus group this Saturday today, uh, 12.45 to 1.45. Um, our theme for this conference with When We Read, uh, we aim to bring the light, the ancestral wisdom of indigenous people of the global south, including the Aymara, Quechua, and Mapuche people. And we celebrate that restorative agriculture is rooted in long standing cultural practice of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. In an agricultural system built on stolen land and the forced labor and exploitation of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, our conference aims to center equity in our food system. So here are some resources. Um, so you, if you want to go a little deep, bit deeper into the racial equity work in your own community. Um, and we like to thank our sponsors and partners. Um, so we have different levels. These are some of our sponsors. So we appreciate their support making this possible, and especially the NOFA team. Um, For hiring. <laughs> uh, yes. They're hiring for a few positions we see here, conference coordinator, administrative director, assistant development director. Awesome. Check them out. Um, so yeah, we're ready now for our presentation. Um, so we'll let Yuri get started and then we had, uh, we'll have a Q&A after the presentation. And we just make some announcements at the end. Um, also, oh, but this will be up here. Yeah.
All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to go ahead and get up this new presentation. You need me. Where is my solution? I know I clicked it in it. You can go. Oh, okay, great. Okay. No, it's not just one. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you to all of you joining online and to everything. Uh, I'm here to speak to you a little bit today about how you can support insect life in general um, with the use of native plants. Next slide. So, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of bad news out there about the environment. I think that uh, if I can sum up the sort of twin crises of our age at the moment that we are facing the loss of biodiversity and climate change. Um, these things uh, have huge, huge impacts on uh, not only plant communities, but all of the things that rely on plant communities. Um, and I think that um, we just need, we need more people paying attention to these issues. Um, I think that the idea of biodiversity um, is not just about a sort of quantitative number of different things that are out there. It's also about the proportions of things. Um, there's a sort of related concept uh, in biodiversity um, that talks about the proportionality of things. So, what this is is um, not just you know, if I if we were to take a look at a, uh, an old field or a meadow, and we could come up with a number of different species that are there, you know, I could put on my botanist hat and say there are 127 species of plants here and X number of different insects that are here. Uh, but that number doesn't give us any kind of idea of um, the health or the net relative proportions of any number, of any single one of those things. So you could have uh, a meadow full of uh, mugwort or an invasive plant uh, and have a handful of native plants in there and you still have the same number of biodiverse and the same number of different things. So proportionality is this idea that, that sort of questions, and this is not something that anybody has the answer to, but how many of one thing is needed in order to, uh, for it to survive and to thrive? Does it mean you need 100,000 individuals? Do you need a million? Do you need 10,000? Uh, it's not really clear, um, but what I think it is, is a call for us to, to sort of collectively, and this is, I think, one of the core messages behind using native plants, either in design spaces and gardens and farms uh, and, and promoting their use in parks and other public lands, is that collectively we have an opportunity to support each and every one of those individual things by, uh, by planting a lot of them. In other words, you want to support golden rods, you might have 50 golden rods in your property, but if someone else down the road has 100 golden rods, the next person has another, that collectively makes, gets us more towards this idea of a stable population of plants that can support and thrive in the face of climate change. Um, next slide. Um, from the perspective of insects, because um, this is really sort of a twin talk about insects and plants, um, there are a lot of things here that are causing insects to, to, to decline. Um, the, the relationships that insects have evolved with specific plants is what we're talking about interaction dis disruption. So the idea that these plants have, uh, um, you know, they, they support specialists, they support generalist insects, 
um, and that these pollination systems, if you'd like, are broken when habitat is lost, habitat is fragmented, uh, when both plants and insects are um, subjected to pollution, to pesticide use, um, to nitrification, um, so all of the extra fertilizers that we put on our lawns and things that end up in our waterways, all these things compound uh, um, and, and put real stresses onto our ecosystems and our ecosystem health. Um, and if anything, the last couple of years, we've seen that what were usually predictable seasons, in other words, things getting cold in the winter and there being snow and uh, uh, you know, last year, just thinking last year, we had a really severe drought here, you know, about eight weeks or so, no measurable rain. This year, completely different. It seems like it rains every week. Uh, and so there's not any kind of a, a, a predictable pattern anymore. Um, and I think that this, all of this kind of sums up to cause a lot of people to feel a certain degree of anxiety about what the future holds. And this is, I think, why uh, um, the use of native plants and being intentional about um, supporting wildlife is a way in which people can feel like they're making a difference and like they're doing something positive in the face of all this bad news. Um, I, I'm sort of trying to set the stage here in a way, not that my entire talk is gonna be just about that depressing things because nobody wants to listen to that. And then you leave feeling dejected that everything's going poorly and wrong and it's not really the point. So um, next slide, please. So again, to put this in context, 80% um, of all flowering plants on the planet rely on some sort of insect mediated pollination in order for them to be able to set seed and be successful. Um, and so we're talking about hundreds of thousands of species of plants across the, across the planet. Uh, bees alone are responsible for the pollination of nearly a third of all food crops from in the United States. Um, and we're not just talking about honeybees. And if anybody keeps honeybees, I'm, I'm not against honey, I like eating it, but honeybees are part of the problem too. Um, wild pollinators, so this includes all of the groups here, so not just bees, but wasps and flies and beetles and all, and all, all of insects uh, um, are twice as effective at pollinating and producing fruit and seed set uh, uh, than honeybees are. Um, and they offer for free a huge dollar value of pollination services for, uh, for the agricultural sector in this country. Um, so it's, it's really a, a, a tremendous amount um, of, of value. And this number uh, is something that I found it was an was a estimate from 2007, and it's likely much more than that now. Um, so um, I think it's incredibly important if you want to support insects, you also have to give them, and particularly pollinating insects, you need to give them the kinds of food, the kinds of resources and nesting habitat that they need in order for them to be able to uh, provide all these services for free. Next slide, please. question. I just wonder if you could clarify why you say uh, these are part of the problems because they're, um, you were not looking for alternatives to pollinate because they were just relying on bees. Is that your take? Or what is, is that? It, 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 the issue is more with honeybees specifically. What, what is it? Uh, I have some slides for me. No, no worries. It's a good question. Now, and now there's justification for that coming that we'll look at later on. Okay. So, um, a lot of these insects are, are, and wild pollinators are what you would consider keystone species. And so, keystone species is, a, is sort of a concept where uh, um, these particular organisms, whether they're insects or plants, um, really anchor an ecosystem based on the number of relationships that they foster and keep going. And so, from the from the uh, from the insect world, um, these wild pollinators and their actions through uh, interactions with plants provide food and shelter, and nesting habitat for all different kinds of wildlife. Um, and if we want to protect the diversity of those pollinator interactions, we also have to uh, maintain the, the, the plants that are crucial to those. Uh, and so all of those things together uh, are really what's needed for 
healthy and diverse ecosystems. So wild pollinators are, as I said, all these different groups here, bees, wasps, butterflies, and moths, uh, beetles, flies, birds, even spiders to some extent too, things that we wouldn't think of as being really traditional pollinators. Um, next slide, please. Um, Priscilla online is wondering if um, you can repeat the questions in the audience. So oh, sure, sure. Online can... Yes, Priscilla, so the question was around um, what exactly is the concern with honeybees? And I was uh, telling our friend here in the audience that um, I have some slides coming a little bit later on uh, and that I'll address those specifically coming up. So um, keystone species for plants, for example, um, are they're identified as being keystone, again, because of the numbers of relationships that they support. And I'm very intentionally showing you a white oak forest here, uh, and I'm assuming most people have heard of Dotalamy and it's good work with, uh, with moths and butterflies. And oaks have been identified as supporting over 480 species of moths and butterflies. And this is not because the adults are there interacting with the tree, but because the foliage of the tree is the food for all the caterpillars that then turn into moths and butterflies. So if you want to, if you don't have a lot of space and you want to get, a, you know, want to support a, a huge diversity of, of insect life, at least things that have wings and fly like moths and butterflies, plant an oak tree. It's very simple. Um, other things like willows and maples, elms, these are uh, generally common trees um, that support hundreds of butterflies. And then this is just one small subsection of a tremendously huge diverse group that make up all the insects. Um, so focusing on keystone plants uh, and uh, keystone plant species helps support the diversity of keystone insect species. So they're both related to one another. Um, next slide, please. So in that uh, uh, diversity of insects is the resilience that we're looking for in ecosystems. Um, Diversity in, in terms of numbers of species richness of plants, diversity in insect richness, and, and all of those interactions uh, uh, provide a degree of uh, resilience to ecosystems, to changes. And built into that resistance is also um, what I would call functional redundancy. So there are many different organisms that are performing similar services, if you'd like. So, this is a wet meadow that uh, uh, is spread behind the Sami farm. Um, it's wonderfully diverse. You have a lot of different plant species here that are growing on this particular land and in this particular soil type and, and uh, water regime. And the plants themselves are holding the soil in place. They're helping to filter the water that passes through it. So they're doing all these things for the ecosystem. Um, the diversity of plant species also means that they can support a broader diversity of insect and insect interactions, and all of those things uh, are, are working together to ensure that the plants can make seed, they can exchange genetic information just the same way that the insects do the same thing, um, and all of those things make this a particularly resilient meadow, uh, whether it gets flooded, whether it's dry, it doesn't matter because uh, there's enough genetic diversity for it to continue and to function and there's functional redundancy. So that is really the key here is what we're, what we're looking people to do or asking folks to do is not just to plant one particular kind of native plant because it happens to draw a lot of pollinators, but consider planting many different kinds of ones and extending that floral resource throughout the entire season. And we'll come to that uh, in a little bit. Um, next slide, please. So from the insects perspective, um, the more species rich a particular place is, uh, it feeds itself into pollinator conservation. So the more species you have, the more interactions, the more uh, uh, um, uh, varied uh, pollination services can be. And the more you increase those plant pollinator interactions that provides food and shelter and nesting opportunity on up the food chain. So, you know, a little chipmunk friend here uh, is has a home in the oak tree again, or the maple tree because of the insects that helped to uh, uh, foster that to make the right environments all the way through to, you know, top predator like our red-tailed hawk here, um, all benefiting from those plant interactions, plant insect interactions uh, at, the, at the earlier stages. So all of this is really tied again to the richness and diversity of plants that are out here. Um, 
Next slide, please. So if we take a look at, um, you know, what exactly each of these two groups get, it's all about being able to pass on adaptations for uh, a greater chance of survival into the future, right? For plants, they have evolved all these nifty ways in order to attract insects to them so that they can exchange pollen to produce seed and pass on those adaptations. Sometimes adaptations are not things that you can see. You can't look at a plant and say, hey, that's drought tolerant or that's disease resistant. Um, but the more that this, the, the more interactions they have, the more individuals they have to interact from, the greater chances that these beneficial adaptations will be passed on. Mm -hmm. And that is really the key for not only the plant survival in the face of climate change, but certainly for the insects. Similarly, from the insects' perspective, um, what the plants provide in terms of nectar and pollen is food for their young, and it affords them a greater chance of reproductive success. In other words, um, the, if, if this ant here, for example, likes to collect the pollen from the downy phlox plant, um, that means there's going to be more ants down the line and more chances of maybe adaptable ants that, that can, can hang with whatever that climate comes to. It's a very mutualistic relationship, uh, and it's one that has long been forged in, in the crucible of, of evolution. Next slide, please. So if we take a step back here, we've been talking a lot about how important both insects and native plants are. I want to address the idea of what exactly is a native plant. And it's sort of a subjective question, depending on who you ask. Some people would say, well, anything that grows in North America is a native plant. Anything east of the Mississippi, because it'll grow here, means that it is a native plant. Um, you know, maybe something that's only found in the Northeast, for example, as you can see, we're getting increasingly closer and closer. But all of these concepts, North America, Eastern United States, the Northeast, Boston, Cape Cod, Worcester, are all political human designations, right? Um, plants in the wild don't care where they grow, they, they don't identify as being from Massachusetts or from Vermont or from whatever state you might think that, that you happen to be in. Um, next slide, please. So um, this particular concept is, I think, a really important one, and, and it's, it's uh, these are what are called eco-regions. And so this, is a, this was something that was first proposed in the late 70s um, uh, by a man named Omerick. Um, and if you look at, uh, if you Google EPA uh, eco regions, they have four different levels. Uh, level one is very broad strokes, and then each level gets increasingly more granular in detail. This is based on a level three map for the Northeast. And so these sort of amorphous zones here were really put together to reflect uh, um, similarities in soil type, plant community cover, uh, hydrology. Uh, land use. So, you know, a, a clear example, if anybody knows that the Cape and the islands, Long Island and South Jersey are all dominated by primarily sandy soils, pine and oak trees, uh, and they have very similar flora. And so that is all united into what's called the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens region. Similarly here that uh, Western Massachusetts, a little bit here in central Massachusetts, most of the mountains in Vermont and New Hampshire, all the way up in the western parts of, of Maine, the Adirondacks right here, and Catskills all share similarities in terms of geology and, and, uh, uh, and, and plant cover, and which is why those are all united and together. And so you will find if you study native plants, some plants are only distributed within one particular eco region. So think about coastal plants that, uh, that you could only find like prickly pear cactus is a great example of something that really is only on the coast. You're not gonna find it at the mountains. There are other plants that have broad distributions that uh, occur in multiples of these eco regions. And so uh, what we're proposing is that um, to define what is actually native, you want to look at what exists within the eco region where you happen to garden or farm or live or work. Um, ideally, you would want to find and source your plants from within that same eco region. And I'll give examples of why that's important. Next slide, please. 
So this is sort of what's at the core of the idea of what's called a local ecotype. Okay. So uh, a local ecotype is something that is adapted to the conditions of where it evolved, right? So it's adapted to the soil and drainage and climate of here. Uh, when you source it from here, it maintains all of those existing relationships. And you can't look at this particular spotted horseman and say, well, I know exactly every single insect that interacts with this plant, but there's a lot. Some of it, unless you sit there and watch it 24 hours a day. Um, sourcing plants and growing them from seed and from the wild also samples and maintains some of the genetic diversity that's out there. And that is really key to uh, the adaptability of both the plants and the insects that they support to survive in a certain future. Um, and generally, if you, if you cite them properly, they will require less uh, resources. Next slide. So where things come from is this idea of provenance of plants. And so in the art world, if you'd like, uh, provenance is a, is a record of ownership. It's really a record of documentation that says this piece of artwork is authentic because we can trace it all the way back to whoever created it. And, it, and it, it's all about documentation. Similarly with plants, of known provenance, particularly if you're growing them from seed, there's information that's attached to it that should follow the plant for its entire life wherever it goes. So where was it collected? By whom? What sort of plant community did it exist in? All that stuff is a record of documentation that allows you to know that what you're planting is actually from the place that you think it is. And this is something that in the broader horticultural industry is very poorly done. Um, and it's mostly because the horticulture industry is really interested in having you buy as many plants as possible, and they don't really care where they come from. And the way that, you know, when here I'm talking about large scale production in horticulture, a lot of stuff is grown from cuttings, or they'll buy wholesale little liners, so smaller plants that were grown somewhere else for cheaper, and they'll pop them on up and then sell it to you at a retail price. And that chain of documentation is lost, but it's really important to know this stuff. Next slide, please. So, because provenance is important too, um, all of the connections that these plants foster and have evolved with are subject to um, timing. So this is what they're talking about phenology. So this is like a it's it's when the plants emerge in the spring and when the insects come out of hibernation or when their eggs hatch. It's all very carefully timed to coincide so that when the insects are out, there's a resource for them. And similarly, when the plants are out, that they have a way to get pollinated and make seed and do the things that they want to do. And so there's this really wonderful uh, 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 connection. Um, most folks here, I'm assuming, have heard of growing degree days. So this is this idea of the average number of days above freezing in any given place. And looking at this list here, you can see that from Florida to Maine, there's a pretty big difference in how uh, how many days on average things are above freezing. Um, my example I want to use is red maple, right? So red maple is a wonderful tree and its distribution extends from Florida all the way up into Maine. If I took a plant from the seed in Florida and I planted it all the way up in Maine, it would not do well at all because it's not evolved to this much shorter time period in the dough. Okay, so. Um, similarly, if I took a, a, a red maple that was evolved in Maine and I brought it down to, to, to Florida, it would similarly struggle um, because the timing is off. And it's not just the longer season or shorter season necessarily, but it's also all the relationships that that plant has with the insects in, in its place. Uh, and so this is, I think, one of the strongest arguments for why the timing is really important and why provenance matters. Um, you want to have plants that are adapted to either a shorter growing season. So a plant that evolved in Maine is going to set flowers sooner. Uh, it's going to set seeds sooner because it's a shorter window for it to do all of that versus something at, at all the way down in Florida or from South Carolina that's going to have a longer growing season. It might take a little bit longer to come in flower, longer to set seed. Uh, all those things are uh, tied to the climate in which those things evolve and why environments is important. Next slide, please. So um, 
as I said before, we have a, a real wide variety of pollinating insects. I'm going to focus a little bit mostly on pollinating insects here because um, I think for many people in farming, um, pollination is a way for seed and food settling. You know, you, that's what you really want. You want to harvest these things, except for you know, baking things and other things. But um, pollinators are a huge group. So wasps uh, include things like, you know, cicada killer here. All right, this is a, a an organism that um, primarily predates cicadas, and it doesn't actually kill them; they paralyze them, and then they put them into an underground nest, and then they lay an egg on it so that. It's progeny can eat a lot of very cool, but very interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's wasps and then wasps that parasitize other wasps. And there's a whole world of, of interactions here. Um, and and but it's not just about them flying around trying to kill other cicadas. They also visit plants, they need sugar, they need energy, so they're also pollinators. Next slide, please. Um, beetles. So uh, Eastern North America has over 30,000 species of beetles. And beetles uh, are what I would call the original pollinators. They, uh, they evolved long before bees and wasps did and were responsible for um, pollinating things like magnolias and, and uh, water lilies and things that were very early emerging flowering plants. Um, but they still play an incredible role. There are things like flower longhorn beetles. Uh, these are goldenrod soldier beetles that right around now you're really gonna find a lot of those active um, and, um, and, and uh, doing their thing. Next slide, please. Flies, similarly, they're not just things to be swatted. And, and uh, uh, there's a whole group called flower flies and bee mimics. So they're flies that have the black and yellow uh, colorations. They look like bees, and they're trying to uh, uh, um, operate on the assumption that, that they won't get eaten because they look like a bee. Um, and flower flies specifically because they like flowers, uh, even all the way up to uh, you know pretty hard looking flies there. Um, they all are uh, important pollinators as well. Next slide, please. All the way up to hummingbirds. You know, hummingbird is probably the only bird pollinator that we have here. Um, and they're wonderful pollinators of traditional plants like cardinal flower and uh, our trumpet honeysuckle. Um, but they're also really, really attracted to things like jewelweed here. And jewelweed is a very common annual native species that grows anywhere where it's damp. Um, and if you grow it, uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to get hummingbirds, which is a delight in the garden. Um, next slide, please. Moths, similarly. Um, this is one of my favorite moths. This is the hummingbird clear wing moth. Um, but moths, along with butterflies, are incredibly ecologically important in terms of pollination services, particularly for flowers that have really long tubular shapes because they've got that really long basket. So I don't know if you can see it kind of curled up there. Um, they also are really important pollinators of night blooming plants. Um, so most of them are active during the night. Um, so another really important group that can be supported through the use of native plants. So all of this, which is say is that when you have a, a diversity of native plant species, you will also attract a diversity of insects. Um, all of these guys were, were taken uh, at Garden of the Woods within five minutes of each other uh, on this particular wild bergamot plant. So wild bergamot, really wonderful plant for all these reasons, plus you can make tea out of the leaves. It's a, it's a really wonderful, useful plant. Next slide, please. Um, some of the more specific relationships that exist here. So spring beauties is a, one of our spring ephemerals that kind of brings a lot of uh, uh, color and life to the early uh, forest floor. Um, and there's a spring beauty mining bee who relies on spring beauty. So if you don't have spring beauty around, the bee disappears. It's a very incredibly specific relationship that has to be fostered by having the food that it needs. Next slide, please. Um, I think this relationship between native plants and insects is probably best told by monarchs and milkweeds. Everybody knows about this. Um, we have a lot of wonderful milkweed species here. So purple milkweed, four-leaf milkweed, clasping milkweed. Next slide, please. 
but they are by no means the only insects that interact with milkweeds. You have milkweed tussock moths, which are really cute and furry. They've got the same colorations. They pick up the same chemical defenses from eating milkweeds. Uh, dog bane beetles, similarly, also capable of withstanding some of the uh, uh, defense mechanisms. And of course, the monarch. Next slide, please. Um, and um, next slide, please. Um, and so, other incredibly uh, uh, important relationships or specific relationships are turtle head here, which is primarily pollinated by bumblebees. Um, and it's really delightful to watch the bumblebees struggle. They have to push their way into the flower. And then when they're inside, they make this contented little buzz as they're getting their sugar. Um, but it's really a plant that if you're a tiny bee, you're not gonna be big enough or muscular enough to get in there. Um, this plant also happens to be, next slide please, um, the sole host for Baltimore checker spots. So if you wanna have this really charismatic little butterfly, you have to give it the food that it needs. And so the caterpillars will eat the foliage and then turn into this beautiful butterfly. Uh, next, please. And this relationship extends beyond uh, pollinators to things that eat pollinators. So you have things like crab spiders. And we just marvel how this particular spider is perfectly camouflaged to hang out in that particular plant so that it can try to eat pollinators. Next, please. Um, goldenrod crab spiders is another great example. These ones have the ability to change their body color from white to yellow in a couple of days so that it can hang out and eat. And you might ask, well, what benefit is that for us, for humans, for plants that have predators on, on, on flowers? It keeps insects fit. It keeps them uh, wary. It keeps them, uh, uh, you know, it sort of helps if there's, if there's, if it's just all part of the, the general web here. So next please. Um, so bumblebees particularly are um, one of the most effective crop pollinators. And what I want to point to here is this particular pollination system called buzz pollination. So here's a native plant called Eastern Shooting Star. And you can see the bumblebee clasps onto the bottom and it has to vibrate its wings at just the right uh, frequency to shake the pollen out. And only bees that are big enough and that can vibrate at the right frequency can do that. Now, it turns out that that same pollination syndrome is used by all of your solanaceous crops. Eggplants, peppers, potatoes all have the same flower shape and the same mechanism. Cranberries as well. And so if you want effective pollination and fruit set for these important food crops, you want to make sure you've got a diversity of bumblebees as well. Next, please. So here we get to the honeybee. Okay. So honeybees are uh, well. Let me let me take a step back and say that for specifically for bees, um, Eastern North America has over two hundred species of bees. The honeybee is one of those. All right. Of those over 200 species, only 5% of them are social insects, meaning the overwhelming majority of them are solitary nesting and can be really small, all right? So bees, honeybees particularly, because they are perennial, they form large colonies, they basically outcompete all of the smaller guys. Um, they are fiercely territorial. Um, they're generalists and they will swarm onto plants and basically take out all of the pollen, leaving nothing for the native pollinators to be there. Um, they prefer lots of one area and they'll keep feeding until uh, all of the nectar is gone and then they'll move on. They have a much larger foraging range, right? Many of the smaller uh, uh, solitary bees um, will maybe only range 100 to 300 yards away from where they nest. Whereas honeybees can travel over, you know, let's say about two miles to find forage, right? They're active for longer in the season. Um, and you can have them there as long as you have sufficient plant diversity to, to, uh, uh, to cover everything. Next slide, please. Um, this I thought was really interesting. See, I know it's a lot of words, but. Um, 40 hives residing on wildlands for three months collects the pollen equivalent of 4 million wild bees. So 
they're just voracious, they outcompete, and they reduce the diversity of other insects when they're present. So this is the issue with honeybees. And then it's sort of like if we're having maybe, a, a, and this is a, 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 um, a useful analogy, um, if you wanted to save birds, it's like saying everybody should keep chickens, All right? It's not the right way to go, to go about it. You're not gonna save pollinators by keeping honeybees. In fact, you're gonna be driving them away or skewing it towards the other kinds of generalists that can compete with them. So honeybees is a, it's a, it's a, um, you know, a sticky situation. You know, it's, it, it, people like honey, they like, they, they identify with honeybees, but I think unwittingly by keeping them, particularly in farms and other larger orchards, you're, you're pushing out what could be a, a more diverse uh, group of pollinating insects. Uh, and ones that tend to be better pollinators of individual plants. Um, so um, that's the whole issue with the honeybee. You know, it's not that I don't like honey, but I think that they are uh, in sufficient numbers. Um, they're, they're really driving out the diversity that we want. That's key to the resilience of all of these ecosystems. I should have said it in the beginning, but I'll reiterate it now, is that everything from your backyard garden to the campus here to the farm is all connected together, right? Nothing happens in a little bubble. Um, and so you might live next to a farm and you're like, why am I not seeing a lot of pollinators when all I get are honeybees is because your neighbor has a hive and they're coming over to take all of the floor resources away. So the way to try to combat that again is to plant more native plants and more diversity of native plants that can help to uh, sustain some of these specific relationships. Next, please. So, of that, of the uh, the. Were you allowing me to go back? No, it's okay. Uh, uh, that's fine. So, of the uh, two hundred plus uh, um, species of bees, specifically, uh, about a quarter of them are called pollen specialists. And the, the previous slide was uh, sort of a, an illusion or an analog to dietary restrictions, right? We all understand people, I have, I have a niece and a nephew that are both celiac. Uh, and so we have to be very careful about gluten when they come to visit. And so similarly, these pollen specialists, they have to have the right kind of food in order for them to survive. If they don't have the right kind of food, they disappear. It's that simple. It's not like they have a choice to go eat something else. Um, they are tend to be local, they tend to be smaller. Many of them are solitary nesting. And so maybe they're only active for spring into summer or in summer and then later on into the season. Um, and because of the pressure on their preferred species, they tend to be much more sensitive to climate change than other birds and insects. Um, next slide, please. So the following list here uh, of plants are ones that. Um, will support specialist bees, but the wonderful thing is that they'll also support generalists as well. So you're really getting a twofer. So within the carrot family, you have your golden alexanders here. Next, please. Um, in the aster family, you have loads and loads of, of, of options. And the aster family tends to be um, really a, a group, a family that that really supports a great diversity of insects. So everything from Things that you might consider weeds like flea banes, um, all of the different asters um, and tick seeds, um, cone flowers, black eyed Susans. Next, please. Sunflowers, blazing stars, more asters, thistles, even thistles. People tend to think of thistles as bad plants, but both uh, field thistle and pasture thistle are really wonderful at attracting and supporting insects. Uh, your iron weeds, sneeze weeds, purple headed sneeze weeds. Next, goldenrods. We have lots of goldenrod species here. Um, and there are goldenrods for every type of situation. If you have a lot of space, there are goldenrods that can be very aggressive and need a lot of space. If you have small spaces to work with, there are goldenrods that are relatively well behaved. Uh, that won't take a lot of seed. They won't send out a lot of rhizomes. It's not the kind of thing that you wish you never planted. Um, Joe pie weeds, really great ones. Beggar's ticks, next. 
um, bone sets and groundsel are all wonderful options. And you have things like the groundsels here that bloom in the early part of the springtime, uh, summer bloomers all the way through into fall blooming. You know, I always think of fall as aster and goldenrod season around here. Um, and they provide really important resources for all of those insects to be able to get ready for winter coming. Next. In the bellflower family, you've got other companions. You've got uh, uh, Venus looking glass up here, tall bellflower, uh, harebells. Next. Um, in the heath family, you have a lot of shrubs that are really wonderful. Uh, bearberries, azaleas, uh, rhododendrons, um, things like uh, huckleberries, winter green. Next slide, please. Cranberries, blueberries, both high bush blueberries and low bush blueberries. So thinking that this, you know, if anybody grows blueberries, for example, um, just by growing blueberries as a crop, you're going to be attracting and supporting a wider variety of pollinators than you would with uh, a, a, you know, a row of, of peppers or, or uh, um, eggplant or something like that, right? Plus, the, the, these are all perennials. So they're going to come back every year and every year, you know, to replant them. Which they're less resource intensive than that. Next, please. In the mint family, you've got some really wonderful things like Oswego tea up here and wild bergamot. Um, these are really wonderful pollinator plants that also have uh, 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 culinary and medicinal uses. Next, please. The Marlboro family, um, these are all your loose stripes, right? And so these tend to be uh, wetland edge plants that are really important to support uh, um, oil bees and resin bees. Next, please. The rose family, we've got a couple different things. Um, next, like wild strawberries, for example. Saxifrage, these tend to be more shade and moist lovers here with foam flower, foam flower on the bottom and bishop's cap on the top. Next. In the fig work family, you have all your beard tongues, both hairy beard tongue and uh, regular beard tongue. Next, the vervain family here with the uh, blue vervain on the left is another good wetland plant. And then lastly, I love violets. Um, violets are really cheerful. They come in a lot of different colors. They grow relatively easily. There are violets that will adapt to wet conditions, moist conditions, all the way to dry conditions. Um, the flowers are edible and really wonderful for the salads. Um, and if it's ever too much, they're easy to weed out. Um, so that's a really, I, I can't have enough violets. Um, okay. So then the next, what's coming next are uh, a, a list of plants uh, for bees that have different length tongues, okay? And so this is, again, thinking about how uh, the shape of the flower interacts with the different kind of pollinator that it's that it attracts. So if you have a short tongue, you're not gonna be able to do something with a long tubular flower. You won't be able to access the nectar. So you've got your different milkweeds here are really important. Even common milkweed that can be a little bit weedy, but uh, is a really wonderful uh, plant with a lot of ecological value. Next, please. Uh, bush honeysuckle and button bush. If you have uh, um, ecologically harmful honeysuckle, rip it out and replace it with a native bush honeysuckle. Um, you'll get a lot of the same uh, um, pollinators without the ecological harm that some of these introducing plants are causing. Next. So if you have longer tongues, again, so you're seeing flowers that have that longer tubular shape here with the spike lobelias, the monkey flowers, the turtle heads. Next, um, wild flax, hyssop, false indigo. Um, sorry, go back one. Yeah, well, it's, it's okay. Uh, false indigo is actually a wonderful dye plant. Uh, a couple, couple of colleagues of mine have made uh, really wonderful purple indigo dyes from this plant. Um, all the way to uh, our uh, native blue flag iris, jewelweed, uh, dragon head here. Uh, so you can see, on the, you know, there's a whole variety of color and, and options here uh, to support different insects that have different shaped tongues. Next. Um, so these are nectar plants. What's coming now are plants that provide pollen for all those different ones. So most of your St. John's warts, again, if you're, uh, if you're interested in herbology and medicinal uses, a lot of these are really wonderful plants. So there's three different uh, um, St. John warts here. Next, um, willows. And I think willows are a real 
uh, an important part of this whole story because they're amongst the first things to bloom in the springtime. And they're really crucial for providing resources for really early emerging insects. Um, willows have lots of other use, uses as well. Um, you can keep them, you can coppice them and harvest the, the, um, um, the wood. You can, you can make baskets and wattle fences. There's all sorts of things you can do with the wood itself. So it's not just about supporting the insect. I'm trying to spin here that these plants are useful as well as being ecologically valid. Next. Uh, flowering raspberries, steeple bush, uh, our native roses, similarly, are really great as pollen plants. Next. So to put this into perspective again, too, this is an older, uh, older map here showing um, the flight patterns for all different groups of songbirds, waterfowl. Uh, where we live on the East Coast is a major flyway for migrating birds. So not just the year-round residents that are here, but ones that maybe overwinter in South America and then came all the way up into Canada so they can uh, uh, breed and come back again. Um, and so the reason why you can support all of those by using native plants is because the native plants provide the insects that the birds need. Next slide, please. Um, this nifty little study here showed that a chickadee, a pair of chickadees needs between six to 9,000 caterpillars to raise five chicks successfully. That's a lot of caterpillars. And that's just one pair. 96% uh, of all of our songbirds need insects in order to make, mm -hmm. um, to make more birds, essentially, in the springtime. Even if some of them switch to eating fruit and seeds later on in the season, they have to have the insects. And no other group of plants supports the diversity and just abundance of insect life than our indigenous local trees and shrubs and plants do. So if, any, if you want to see more songbirds around, if you want to get the, you know, the nesting pair of uh, Carolina wrens or chickadees or so forth, plant an oak tree. You know, we said earlier, oaks per, uh, uh, support uh, over 400 species of moth and butterflies, caterpillars, that's where they're going to get that six to 9,000 caterpillars every year. Just tremendous amounts of, of, of insect life. So again, tying all these things together. Um, so things that we can do here, um, you know, if you're thinking about how to incorporate more native plants into uh, a farm operation, um, consider hedgerows with native trees and shrubs. Um, I think it not only provides resources for insects and birds and other wildlife, um, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's better than the multiflora rose and the barberry and other things that tend to escape around the edges of a lot of old farms. Um, buffer strips of wildflowers are incredibly important, not just between crop fields because they'll attract pollinators, they'll attract beneficial insects as well, um, but placing them particularly uh, uh, between uh, water bodies so that any kind of runoff that happens from your farm is being filtered through a buffer strip of wildflowers. These tend to be perennial, so you don't need to replant them every year. Um, many of our native wildflowers are actually wonderful cut flowers too. So cut flowers don't necessarily have to be your traditional annual things that you, you know, see and grow every year. Um, and, and so there's you know, a potential source for revenue there. Um, Growing plants for seed production is another uh, um, sort of increasingly uh, important activity, um, particularly for, for small farms that are looking for ways to diversify their operations. Um, there's a really wonderful group in Connecticut called Eco 59. Um, and they're again called Eco 59 because they exist within that particular eco region. Um, and they are planting uh, essentially um, long rows of wildflowers and harvesting seed and selling the seed as seed packets. Um, and it's locally sourced and it's all organically grown. And it's a really wonderful way to get to that same important kind of plant material back out into the landscape. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, as a gardener, I know I never have enough time to do all the things that I want to do. And I know the same, the same thing happens with farmers too. And if you're going to use your time, you have to make sure that it is worth it for you in the end. Everybody faces a lot of life one way or another. And so 
planting wildflowers sounds wonderful. It's not as easy as just tossing seeds out. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes resources uh, to do that. And so you wanna make sure that if you're going to do it, at least there's some kind of return so that it's worth your time to do it. If you have the free time to plant it altruistically, great. Um, but I doubt there's many people in the room here that have that kind of free time. Um, so um, that's why I'm putting these other ideas in here too, because having those plants on the landscape not only supports all of this wonderful diversity of insect life that we've been talking about, but can also potentially earn you a little bit of money along with it too. So either cut flower, seed production, uh, many of these plants have medicinal uses, they are edible, you can make them as tinctures, they're dye plants, there's a whole variety of things that uh, that can be used, how these plants can be used uh, even after they're done flowering and they've supported all the insect life, um, you, can, you can get more out of that as well. Next. There is a question on the chat if you are going to talk about cultivar. Cultivars. Cultivars. Um, so 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, good. Um, so the question was about will I discuss cultivars and native plants? I'm yeah. happy to. Um, I don't have anything specifically here for cultivars, but um, when it comes to supporting wildlife and supporting insects, my firm belief is that nobody does it better than Mother Nature. All right. Many of the cultivars that are available were bred or selected for aesthetic purposes. We wanted a bigger flower, we wanted a shorter plant, we wanted something uh, different than what uh, Mother Nature created. Um, and this goes back to knowing where the plant came from and how it was grown. Uh, as I said, many cultivars, in order for them to be consistent and uniform, have to be grown by cuttings. And so that means you're having less genetic diversity out there and it's sort of robbing that plant of its chance to be able to adapt to change if you're putting clone plants out there. So I also recognize, and this is, this is a big issue in the native plant world, um, if you go to any garden center or, you know, please don't shop at like Home Depot or Lowe's or any of places because they use a lot of pesticides on their plants. Um, but if you shop at smaller garden centers, three quarters of what you can find, what they're selling are cultivars because they're still catering to people who want to garden for pretty gardens and not necessarily uh, uh, folks that want to make intentional choices to have both pretty and ecologically functional. Um, it's not to say that the cultivar won't attract any insects. They will, they most certainly will. And I get that if that's what you can find, that's what you should use. Indeed. So it, it's, it is not, I think the idea about embracing native plants should be something that is, um, that decision we should feel empowered by. It. And if you decide you wanna remove a non-native or an invasive plant and you replace it with a cultivar or native plant, I think that's a win. And, the idea is that once you start down that path, you will see firsthand more insects, more interactions, all these other positive things out of it that will lead you to say, hey, maybe you should try more and more and more. Um, yes, there is a sense of urgency, of course, you know, uh, and, and I think that's why uh, we do need to take action now. Um, but I don't think it serves anybody to approach it in a panic mode. All right. And when you work with plants, you work with a, an organism that exists on a very different temporal scale of how we exist. Growth and success is measured in seasons and years. And so you have to be patient in that same way and start these interactions and set these things in motion and continue building towards this idea that the more we all embrace native plants, the more we put them on the landscape, incrementally we're providing more resources for what remains and i think that's really the power of this message is that um you know we're not going back in time to a point where things were more abundant and more diverse that ship the sail more time 
But what you can do is act out of a sense of compassion and be forward thinking and say, what can I do to support what remains so that it continue to remain into the future? And that's kind of the point here is that, um, you know, planting a tree isn't about what you can get out of it now. It's what future generations will harvest from it and get from it. You know, and just looking out at the oak trees that are planted here, whoever planted that probably isn't alive anymore, but I would love to sit under that tree and enjoy its shape and honor that decision that somebody put it there. And that's the same way I feel about all these things here and that it's not about me, it's not about what I'm doing now, it's about my son, it's about future generations to be able to enjoy all of the benefits of biodiversity and, and healthy ecosystems. Um, and so that I think is really the most powerful reason why, um, at least from the horticultural side, we can't just have pretty gardens. They also have to be functioning. And I think there's a lot of overlap with the farming community and uh, uh, embracing the idea that uh, uh, local is better, organically grown is better, and that we're both sort of operating uh, with this idea and belief and right and a better future. Yeah. So um, I think that's my last slide. No, I got one more. Can you read this? One more, which is just to say that um, at the state level, there's a number of uh, uh, of uh, bills on the floor right now. Um, if anybody's interested in policy and advocacy, um, there are a number here that are talking about the important role of native plants in urban ecologies uh, and trying to address some of the environmental justice that uh, urban communities face, uh, as well as um, calling out native plants as being important for the resilience of our region as a whole in the face of climate change. And all of these things really rely on the availability of native plants. And this is where like seed production gets important again. Um, if you can't buy it at the local store, be the person to create the seed that you can then distribute out to other people. Um, we just need more people to grow. So um, with that, I will conclude my remarks and be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, so the question was, um, is there a resource um, that uh, provides lists of plants based on ecoregion? Um, there isn't one, and the reason is that um, there are plants that span multiple ecoregions. So, um, you know, like a red maple tree, for example, um, spans, like I said, its natural ranges, Florida to Maine, and there are 50 plus ecoregions that span that geographic distance. Um, there are, um, I'm trying to think of any good resources that I can point you to. Um, National Wildlife Federation has a great website um, that um, does break down ecoregion and has suggestions for plants that would be good for each ecoregion. Um, and um, there's a, 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 a relatively recent publication. Um, if you go to a website called Landscape Interactions, there's a, a whole Pollinator or Pollinate Now initiative. It's a free PDF that you can download um, and that lays out the case for why it's important to include native plants and then have lots of lists of species that would be appropriate for uh, um, urban context, for farmland, for riparian corridors. Um, so they're all kind of tailored a little bit um, for each particular um, situation. One quick follow Sure. What about, um, you have mentioned uh, eco economic yes. Is there any other seed companies or any other list of seed companies that uh, cater to eco regions? Yes. So there's uh, there's a really wonderful group in Portland, Maine called Wild Seed Project. 
I would definitely uh, urge you to check them out. They have uh, some really, they got some nice little publications. They have uh, good resources on their website. Um, they're a really wonderful group. Um, Wild Seed Project. Project. Yeah. Um, and um, I should also take the moment here to say that Native Plant Trust, along with a number of other uh, partners, are launching a Northeastern Native Seed Network, uh, which includes the folks in Connecticut. And our effort is just getting started this year. Um, and uh, it will take a couple of years for us to ramp up the capacity. But the, the aim of it is to provide a reliable source of source identified seed for the Northeast. So this is a, 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 a we see it as a big bottleneck, not only for restoration activities, so people that want to go in and restore natural systems, but also um, a lack of the right kind of seed that feeds into horticulture and agriculture. Um, and if you're looking for native plant seeds now, most folks are going uh, like four or 500 miles away from where their projects are. And there are big uh, 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 seed companies like Ernst Seed or Prairie Moon Nurseries out in Wisconsin uh, that would happily ship you their seeds, um, but it kind of runs against the whole idea of that local is better. Uh, and so the Northeast just doesn't have uh, any kind of a developed um, seed supply chain. And this is part of what the network is attempting to do. Um, one of our other aims is to, uh, because you know, we as a as a as an individual organization can't, we don't have the resources to be a seed company, but we have a lot of expertise, and so our our desire is to create a replicable model that others, so small scale organic farmers, land trusts, and others can take on and use and grow seed uh, in support of this larger effort. And so that's supplying you with the actual, the originals, the, the, the seed that you will need to start your seed increase plots, along with workshops, cleaning help, all the technical uh, uh, details of like, how do I grow this particular wildflower and how do I harvest it and all the sort of the, the you know, the nuts and bolts of how to do it. Um, and so we see the network really is growing as having many, many satellite growers that are all uh, working towards a, a common purpose. So that's something else that um, that you know was born out of a lot of the conversations with the um, Eco 59 folks and the Connecticut NOFA. Um, and we've had conversations with a lot of smaller farmers over the last couple of years and people saying we're really willing to do this and to try it. And in terms of scale, we're talking about half acre or less, nothing that would require any kind of mechanized equipment. We're not quite ready for, you know, tractor mounted acres and acres and acres of seed production, even though, you know, there's, there are uh, requests for seed mixes for, from state DOTs, for example. So they want to take mowed highway mediums and transition those into pollinator meadows or ways to support those. Solar farms is another one that they would love to have some kind of low growing mix that they don't have to mow it. And I think that's a win for everybody. It's less fossil fuels, it's less, uh, and, and, and just creates more habitat. But currently the hundreds if not thousands of pounds of seed that they need for these large scale operations is not available. And so they're still turning themselves to uh, places in the Midwest or further west. Um, but in order to grow this thing and not have it collapse, we have to start slowly and small and really kind of build up at a smaller scale and demonstrate that it's worth it for people to want to be involved. You need, I'm afraid we're out of time. Okay. Um, is there one more question? Or? But maybe for folks that still have a lot of questions, is there maybe a contact of how can people maybe reach out to you? Sure. Or the part um, that if you're open to it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my email address is, um, uh, I'll spell it for you, U-L-O-R-I-M-E-R -E at nativeplanttrust.org. Uh, and I'd be happy to field questions, start conversations with anybody that's interested in potentially getting involved in seed production um, and any other kind of concerns you guys have around added plants and how to welcome them into your, into your operations. Thank you. So,
Thank you all for listening this morning. Thank you. Um, so, thank you for the uh, Was it this one?